Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9. I'm Courtney Friedman. Coming up tonight, more deaths at the local nursing home with the COVID-19 outbreak. The San Antonio Police Department says they've seen a spike in family violence calls, plus a look at how this pandemic has already impacted the Texas wine industry. But first, there are now 503 confirmed COVID-19 cases here in Bear County. That's 47 more than we reported yesterday. The death toll is now 18. 179 cases were from close contact with a confirmed COVID case. 150 cases are community spread. 124 are travel related and 77 people have recovered. New tonight, the city's releasing more information about the patients and the number of available hospital beds and ventilators in San Antonio. For the first time, local confirmed cases by race and ethnicity have been released to the public. Here's a look. Hispanics make up the majority of cases in San Antonio at 216 patients, or just under 47%. 159 patients are white, 69 patients are black, which is 15%, and 13 patients are Asian. To put that in perspective, 60% of Bear County residents are Hispanic, 30% are white, and 7% are black. When it comes to hospital bed and ventilator capacity, 43% of 4,800 staffed beds at all San Antonio Health care systems are available and 71% of our more than 700 ventilators in San Antonio are available. Five additional deaths have now been reported at Southeast Nursing Home and Rehabilitation Center. That's the local nursing home at the center of the COVID-19 outbreak. The city of San Antonio says it's relying on state agencies to take action against the facility after they say the facility failed to report the new deaths that happened over the weekend. The total number of deaths right now is eight. Families with loved ones in the facility feel frustrated they can't get answers and cannot physically go into the home to ensure the loved ones are properly cared for. Ronnie Brigham says his mother died at the center and there was confusion about what caused her death. So I couldn't go see her. They wouldn't give me no information. Nobody, nobody, nobody's calling. Nobody's telling me anything other than the news people. If it remains state licensed, they, they can operate. So the state would have to pull its um, license in order for it to be shut down. To add to the heartache, the family says there cannot be a regular funeral because of city and state mandates. An update now to a story we brought you two weeks ago when the city and county began urging families to stay home. Domestic violence experts told me abuse numbers would spike and they were right. Today, SAPD released numbers showing a 21% increase in family violence calls from 2019 to 2020 year to date. Officers now tell me it's more important than ever for people to realize victim services are still active, including a crucial one for school children. It's part of my series on domestic violence, Loving and Fear. SAPD making a direct connection between the current stress of COVID-19 and spiking family violence numbers. There's no more school, there's no childcare or limited childcare because employees are being furloughed and it will just continue to add to the immense amount of financial stress and burden that was already there and add on top of that communication uh, maybe not being at its optimal communications issues that could be softened by SAPD's positive parenting program or triple P. It gives parents simple strategies to help manage their child's behavior, build strong, healthy relationships and prevent problems from developing. SAPD officer Alicia Pruneda has responded to some of the recent calls for violence or family disturbances. Yesterday I was on scene at a, a shooting in progress and it involved four minors. She wants to remind the public that in cases like this, SAPD PD's handle with care program is still in place. Police notify school districts when children are involved in traumatic situations so the teachers and administrators know to take extra care of that student. Social workers, counselors, and the appropriate uh, staff and administration are informed. They may not be interacting with the child in person, but this is happening. Abuse experts know when survivors are confined to the house, it's harder for them to reach out for help. We can't do anything about it unless they call unless someone calls and sometimes it takes a great act of bravery. If survivors find a way to safely make that call, help will be waiting for them. 
Officer Pruneda also points out that a lot of services are now online, including filing a protective order. You still have to go in and sign the affidavit, but everything else can be handled from a phone or computer. For people without internet access, you're urged to call SAPD's non-emergency number or family violence prevention services so someone can lead you through that process. Those numbers, along with a long list of resources, can be found at ksat.com slash domestic violence. With so many hotel rooms sitting empty right now, there's another use for them amid this pandemic. Tonight, Mayor Ron Nuremberg confirming the city has secured hotel space for people who test positive for COVID-19 so they can isolate themselves from vulnerable family members. The exact process to get a hotel room is still unclear. The mayor also mentioned a potential plan with hotels and the homeless. Last night at 9, Haven for Hope CEO Kenny Wilson told Steve Spreester there was a discussion with the city about possibly using other buildings to help house the homeless. Tonight, this is what the mayor had to say. Um, in fact, we're very close to securing hotel space to ensure there's proper social distancing uh, at homeless shelters so we can move people into um, into actual hotel rooms to, to uh, ensure there's no localized outbreaks in the shelters. Haven for Hope has already been using Mar Hill Elementary as sleeping quarters for some clients. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says the county also has 26 other cities that have shelters. Mayor Ron Nuremberg also mentioned the city has set up what he called homeless hubs near some of the known encampment sites. Right now they are used to help people get food, but he also mentioned there could be a potential for other resources like health screenings. Taking a look at the numbers now in surrounding counties, Hayes County is now reporting 59 cases. That is nine more than last night. Numbers in Wilson, Atascosa and Medina counties are also up tonight with seven, four and six cases respectively. Comal County has 22 cases, Guadalupe 39 and Kendall County 9. Bandera County is still reporting no cases. We have talked about the huge impact this pandemic is having on the economy, a big industry in Texas that's taking a hit, the wine industry. It supports more than 100,000 jobs and more than $4 billion in wages annually. Tiffany Huertas has a look at the challenges ahead and why you should care. There are some people who aren't working right now, a lot of our part-time employees. Um, we just don't have the demand in, in um, visitors. The tasting rooms at Bending Branch Winery in Comfort closed in mid-March because of the pandemic. General Manager Jennifer McInnes says they are currently offering curbside and delivery service and they are still shipping wine. Production is continued to, continuing to be there every day. Um, but it's, you know, a limited number of people. The executive director of economic development and tourism for the governor's office says it's estimated that the coronavirus has already cost the wine industry millions. I did receive a survey from Wine America that actually uh, did a, a national survey to see how it has impacted the wine industry nationally. And there has been $40 million of financial loss um, across the country in the month of March. Adriana Cruz says the wine industry in Texas supports about 104,000 jobs. So $4.3 billion in wages in 2019. The average wage uh, at those wineries is $41,000. Um, so some good wages uh, for an industry that's important to our state, um, not just for uh, the, the farmers and the growers, uh, but also on the tourism side. The wine industry in Texas has been growing. Cruz says in 2003, Texas had 54 wineries. In 2018, more than 500. As the Texas wine industry faces an uncertain future, Cruz believes it will bounce back. The Texas economy prior to this was the strongest in the country, uh, the fastest job creation. Um, and we're expecting that when, when this is all um, done, uh, that we will continue to have a, a strong economy. For the nine, Tiffany Huertas. And Cruz says there are already relief programs available for businesses, including the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Steve Spreester actually had a conversation with Cruz last week on KSAT News at 9 about what impact the pandemic is expected to make on the state's economy. They also talked about the resources available for small businesses. You can watch that whole conversation right now on KSAT.com. VIA is now limiting the number of passengers allowed on buses at any given time. This announcement comes after VIA announced today a bus driver tested positive for COVID-19. Beginning tomorrow, VIA will limit passenger load to 16 riders at a time. Customers are also asked to wear masks and skip a seat when riding. 
VIA has also suspended fares through April 30th, so no customers have to touch the fare box or crowd the door when boarding. As for the driver who tested positive for COVID-19, they are now self-quarantining at home. The last day they worked was March 31st. The buses used by the driver have been cleaned and disinfected. We also have a list of the routes operated by that driver prior to April 1st. You can find that on KSAT.com. Taking a look at national COVID-19 numbers now, according to Johns Hopkins University and Medicine, there are more than 398,000 cases in the U.S. and more than 12,000 deaths. Globally, there are more than 1.4 million cases with more than 82,000 deaths. Let's turn now to the nine at nine. A five year old killed in a shootout. Researchers calling the effectiveness of some fertility apps into question and a roundup of how COVID-19 is impacting communities across the globe. Here's tonight's nine at nine. Police in Jacksonville, Florida, searching for two suspects after a five year old was killed in a shootout. That gun battle was allegedly caused by a fight over $180. The five-year-old was shot in the head and a four-year-old was grazed by a bullet while they were sitting in their mom's car outside the convenience store where this happened. The two children were rushed to the hospital. The five-year-old did not make it. A U.S. District Court judge has denied singer R. Kelly's request to be let out of a Chicago federal prison due to the pandemic. Kelly had surgery while incarcerated and his attorney asked that he be let out on bail due to a risk of contracting COVID-19. However, in denying his request, the judge said the singer had not explained how his surgical history placed him at greater risk. There are no confirmed COVID-19 cases at the facility where Kelly is being held. In Kentucky, a doctor accused of getting violent with teens over social distancing. Witnesses say the doctor approached the group of teens and was upset they weren't social distancing. According to a police report, the man then forced his hands around a girl's neck. For someone to lay their hands on a, a child, I, I don't care who you are or what they did. The hospital where the doctor works has placed him on administrative leave. Police in Pakistan have arrested dozens of doctors and medical staff protesting a lack of personal protective equipment. The protest comes a day after 13 doctors in one city contracted the novel coronavirus. A Florida mom says she was shocked when her fourth grader's class video call was interrupted by pornography. He was logged in, I was doing the dishes, then I started hearing like bad words. So I'm like, what's going on? Are you in the class or you're on something else? And he's like, no, I'm on the class. She says when she ran over, she saw a pornographic video playing on the screen. This is something called Zoom bombing, when someone hijacks a video call session. Zoom says it went from 10 million users last year to nearly 200 million by March of this year. Smartphone apps that help women monitor their menstrual cycle or fertility may not be as accurate as advertised. A new review raises a red flag on effectiveness. Several studies indicate fertility apps can be successfully used as a means of contraception, but not all of them have been designed to include the feature, putting women who use these apps as a contraceptive at risk of an unintended pregnancy. Hilton and American Express are teaming up to offer up to a million hotel room nights to frontline healthcare workers for free during the coronavirus pandemic. It will give them a place to sleep, recharge, or isolate to protect their families so money won't come out of their own pockets. The stays will be available from Monday through May 31st. Scientists have discovered this creature in the Indian Ocean. It's a giant siphonophore. The organism is closely related to a jellyfish, but looks like silly string. Scientists say its outer ring alone measures roughly 145 feet in length. And actor Matthew McConaughey brought some cheer to seniors isolated at a Round Rock senior living facility. He and his family played virtual bingo with them. We got an I-24, I-24. Oh! McConaughey was joined by his wife, their children, and his mom. To read more about these stories, head to KSAT.com. Hey everybody, meteorologist Sarah Spivey here with a quick look ahead to your Wednesday forecast. But first, I thought we could recap today. Today was definitely on the warm and muggy side, significantly warmer than yesterday. We did see some sunshine in the afternoon and that really allowed us to warm up. We were near 85 degrees for the high temperature today, which is about six degrees above the average. And this morning was just downright humid. Tomorrow morning, gonna be humid as well. We'll start off the day with some areas of fog, but in the future, 
future cast, you can see that it's hinting at the potential for one or two isolated showers or storms. I'm only gonna give it a 20% chance, but still it's worth noting that because our atmosphere is supercharged right now, any storms that develop, even though the chance for storms is very low at 20%, any storms that develop could be on the strong or severe side. Of course, we'll keep an eye on that for you, but in summary, for your Wednesday, starting off with areas of patchy fog, it'll be gray, and then by about noon, we'll start to clear out a little bit. In the afternoon, partly cloudy skies, and again, only a 20% chance for an isolated storm, but if it develops, it could be strong. We'll see a high temperature near 90, so it's gonna be hot the hottest day of the week so far, with south winds at five to 15 miles per hour. Now, although we only have a small chance for isolated storms tomorrow, our better chance for rain is actually going to be on Thursday. Thursday is the day that I really want to focus on for the potential for some strong to severe storms. Over in southwestern California right now, uh, there is a Rainmaker, an upper level low pressure system that's currently bringing Los Angeles rain. That's going to move our way by Thursday. And on top of that, we're also going to see a cold front move through on Thursday as well. That's going to help kick up the atmosphere. So on Thursday, we got a 60% chance for storms. We'll also see some showers on Friday and some more storms on Saturday. But Thursday is kind of more in our 2020 vision. And so I want to show you the potential risks in some severe weather for Thursday. Wind and hail are going to be the main things that we're concerned about. Again, if a strong storm develops on Thursday, it could have the potential to produce wind gusts of 60 miles per hour. It could also have the potential to have a quarter sized hail or even larger sized hail within it. And we are a little concerned about flooding because we've seen so much rain since late last week. So we'll be on the lookout for that as well. But again, storms will probably be around on Saturday, on uh, Thursday rather. If they become severe, they could have the potential for wind gusts or hail. So that's what we're looking at right now. So that front is going to move through on Thursday and it's actually going to cool us down a lot for Friday. We'll have cloudiness and some showers on Friday. Our high will only be in the 60s. But then on Easter Sunday, late on Easter Sunday, we're going to get another front and that's going to really cool us down even more. Our highs on Monday and Tuesday early next week are only going to be in the 60s. So tomorrow, only a small chance for isolated storms. Those storms become more likely on Thursday. Some of them could be severe. Showers on Friday, storms again on Saturday, but on Easter Sunday, it should actually be really nice outside. In the 80s for the high temperature, relatively low humidity, gonna be nice. And then for the start of next week, a lot of sunshine and cooler as well. So with the potential for storms on Thursday, I'd encourage you to continue to check back in with us. We'll be streaming at nine every night here uh, during the weekdays and we'll have more updates for you. I personally wanna give a shout out to uh, my awesome cameraman from home. His name is Michael. Um, he's also my husband. So Hi. thanks for helping me out You're so much. You're awesome. <laughs> he actually would, we um, were engaged long distance for a time period and he would watch the news at nine to see me give the forecast. So he's pretty awesome. And now he gets to shine with the camera and the lights. Have a great evening, everyone. Hello to Michael. Thank you for that. We'll be back in one minute. Welcome back. We're continuing our effort tonight to fight fear with facts as the coronavirus pandemic continues to impact communities across the globe. Infectious disease expert and doctor, Dr. Ruth Berggren from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio is back with us this week to help us get answers to your coronavirus questions. Dr. Berggren, thank you for joining us again. The first question has to do with testing capacity. I mean, the good thing is the uh, requirements for testing were loosened, so if you have the symptoms, you can get a test. What is San Antonio's testing capacity and what is the turnaround time like 
getting results? So, you know, we have been lucky compared to a lot of cities in the United States because we've had the capacity to do an additional 3,500 tests per week funded by the federal government. That's the testing that's available for free down at the Freeman Coliseum. Um, the turnaround time has been slow. The turnaround time is quoted as being four to five days. It could be even longer. And that particular 3,500 tests a week capacity that we were given um, will only be up until the 10th of April. But in the meantime, a lot of our private labs have come on board and there are a number of places where you can get tested now, including, including at UT Health, of course, uh, Texas Med Clinic. And the turnaround time, though, is still slow for most people. Uh, we're quoted four to five days. I sent a patient for testing on April 1st, and I am still waiting for the commercial lab to give me that test result. Today is April 7th, and both the patient and I are very eager and very concerned about that test result. Now, I want to tell you that at University Hospital, we have a variety of different kinds of tests for COVID that are available thanks to the efforts of our incredible laboratory personnel. And we actually can get about 130 tests a day done. I think that's roughly our capacity in the hospital. And we can get a 24-hour turnaround. Wow. However, that 24-hour turnaround is reserved for special people, the sickest people in the hospital, as you might imagine. We really need to know quickly if a patient in the hospital has COVID-19 or not, because we've got to segregate them, isolate them from the other sick people in the hospital. And the other group that are prioritized for this more rapid turnaround in test are, of course, the healthcare workers. Because if we don't know if their fever is due to COVID, then they're out for a long time and we start to deplete our healthcare force, workforce, um, if we can test them and find out that they're negative, then we can get them back to work and on duty much more quickly. So uh, we do have this capacity for 24-hour turnaround, but it is focused on the sickest people, the hospitalized people, and the healthcare workers. And this is going to change, Steve. It's, it's going to get better. We really believe it's going to be get better, and that's because there are multiple different kinds of tests that are available and that are coming online. We'll still be limited by shortages of reagents because we have to share you know, across the country, but we are making progress and the turnaround time is going to get better. Good, that's good news. All right, ways to keep healthy while social distancing. I mean, exercise is important for a lot of different reasons in this whole thing. Absolutely, and we've got great weather here. Springtime is always so beautiful in San Antonio. And I see people in my neighborhood getting out and walking and they're doing it appropriately. They're walking in family clusters and they're not congregating and they're having a good time. So get outdoors, walk, walk your dog, shoot some hoops, um, but don't get too close to other people. I also think that people need to think about their eating. Thankfully, we have good food supplies at HEB. I know the lines have been long. I know that it's been hard to get eggs. I had a hard time getting eggs. But still and yet, we have a really solid, steady food supply. And so people should be trying to eat healthy foods, your home more, cook some of your own food, cook healthy vegetables, eat well, exercise, and just continue to follow the rules about the social distancing. And of course, now we have this new recommendation, which I strongly endorse, which is that we wear masks and cover our nose and mouths when we are out and about doesn't have to be while you're exercising, as long as you're social distancing, but it does mean when you go to the pharmacy, when you go to the grocery store, those kinds of places, you need to put your mask on, cover your nose and mouth so you don't infect other people. All right, our next viewer question. Can San Antonio COVID-19 survivors donate plasma? I know there's been a lot of speculation that maybe the blood and the plasma from these survivors could be used to help some of those people who are fighting the disease right now? Right, so that's a really important question and it's being studied right now. And an announcement has been made that in this community that our uh, our South Texas uh, Blood Bank Center is, is willing to um, collect plasma. As to how it gets used, that's still being worked out, but it may in fact prove to be something that's important. Regardless of whether it goes to that purpose or not, 
we still need people to be donating blood for our blood supply because that was something that we were notified early on um, when the shelter in place or the stay home orders came about was that we were seeing a, a decline in our available blood bank supply and of course we need to keep that up. So donating blood is a good idea for either one of those reasons. Yeah, and it's a great way to help when you're at home and you're feeling helpless and you wanted to help in some way, make a mask, donate blood. There are so many different ways that, that you can help. All right, uh, next viewer question. Would the pneumonia vaccine have any protective factors against COVID-19? There's no reason to think that that's the case, but if you're a person who falls into the category of a guideline, you need to get that pneumonia vaccine, you should get it. And so that certainly applies to folks over the age of 65, people who have some sort of condition such as diabetes or kidney failure or HIV that causes them to be uh, immunologically compromised. We have guidelines for who needs to get the pneumonia vaccine. And if you haven't had it and fall into one of those categories, by all means, get it. But there's no reason to think that that's going to protect you from the COVID pneumonia. Yeah. Next viewer question. I have asthma, diabetes and congestive heart issues. What is my actual risk factor if I go to the store and use precautions? So I can't give you a number for that question. I'm glad you're aware that all of those underlying conditions put you at risk for a worse outcome should you become infected. Um, but you do have to live and be a human being. And so you need to go to the store. You need to get your meds picked up. Maybe somebody could help you. That's always a great thing if someone else can step in and help you decrease your risk, provide you with some mechanisms for harm reduction. Um, but when you do go out uh, and you buy, you're buying your food, wear your mask, wear gloves, wash your hands, and if you have it, use hand sanitizer. I keep the hand sanitizer in the door, in the pocket of my door of my car. I sanitize my hands coming in and going out. I, I rub it all over my hands and I rub it on my steering wheel. Uh, and then I wash my hands for 20 seconds when I get into the house. So just keep doing those things. Um, and if you are someone who is medically vulnerable, you might be a person who reaches out to a neighbor or a family or a friend and says, hey, when you go to the grocery store, could you pick up my groceries too? Or you maybe want to take advantage of the online ordering that exists. If you have internet, you can order your groceries online and pick them up curbside. So those are some of the options to decrease your risk. And so I'm glad you're thinking about it. Next viewer question. If members of my family are self quarantining, should I? So to unpack that question, um, we have to think about the difference between isolation and quarantine. Quarantine usually means that you've been exposed and so you're being um, isolated at home to uh, observe whether you're going to develop fever and become ill. So perhaps you've just come in to San Antonio from a high risk area, New York or Italy or someplace where there's a lot of transmission, you're quarantined. That doesn't mean that the people in your home need to quarantine also. You need to separate yourself from them. A different story would be isolation. So if you've actually been diagnosed with COVID or you're being tested for COVID, we're waiting for a test to come back for you because you've got symptoms. You are now in isolation. You're in a room by yourself, ideally. You're using your own bathroom. You're masking when you're in the presence of other people and you're really staying away from everybody else. The people in your home should be very careful. Um, and if they are, if they have to go to their work, they should be masking as all of us are. Um, but unless there's a clear um, evidence that they've been exposed to you for a long period of time, they don't necessarily, you certainly don't have to isolate, okay? Quarantine would be good, but we don't necessarily quarantine everybody in a family just because one person is in isolation. Yeah, okay. Last couple questions have to do with numbers and kind of your perception on what's happening out there and what you see with the numbers, because I'm sure you look at them totally different than the way I look at them or the average person looks at them. Do you think social distancing is working? Are you seeing evidence that social distancing is working? Yes, and the reason we're seeing, we, I can say that is that the the predicted peak keeps getting moved out longer. And so that's a good news, bad news story. We want to hear that this whole isolation 
shelter at home or stay home orders are going to be over soon. So we want to hear that the peak's coming and that we're going to get it over. However, um, the longer it gets put forward into the future, the lower that peak is, which means fewer people sick, fewer people in the hospital, and fewer people dying. And there's a, a resource online which I think is very credible and is encouraging, Steve, and I'd, I'd like to pe- to suggest that people go and look at Community Information Now, CI Now. Um, it's online. And they predict that, you know, we by the first week that we stayed home here in San Antonio, we saved 1,271 lives. Wow. And if you that for 60 days, um, we will have we will have uh, prevented 92,000 people from going to the hospital, and we will have saved 10,000 lives. Now, as miserable as we all are, staying home, 60 days is a long time. I feel like if we think about it in terms of how many lives we're saving, it becomes not only bearable, it becomes honestly our our duty to our fellow human being. So 60,000 uh, at 60 days at home, 92,000 people not in the hospital, 10,000 lives saved for 60 days at home. That seems like pretty reasonable. And I would suggest that people celebrate Passover and Easter during this special week in our community um, by, by thinking about how their behavior uh, and their changes in their behavior is saving lives. That's a good perspective to put on it. And finally, uh, the last viewer question we have is a question I asked you at six o'clock. When will San Antonio reach its peak? So it's hard to say, and the models change depending on the data that we're putting in, and they're by nature imperfect. We've seen models predicting a peak around the 2nd of May and models predicting a peak around the 28th of May. If we average them out or split the difference, we're looking at a mid-May peak. And so today is April 7th. Um, that puts us five weeks away from a peak that's a really long time. And again, it's good news and bad news. It's a long time and that's hard to um, endure at the same time. What it means is our peak is going to be so much lower than places like New York, New Orleans, and Detroit that we will not overwhelm our healthcare system. And that's really what we're striving for. So in there, San Antonio, we can do this. One team, one dream, stay yeah. home, stay safe, save I, lives. Yeah, I love that message. All right, I usually give you the last word, but you know, I think you just, you, you, what you said was just so important. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna let you go. Thank you, Ruth, for uh, your time. Every Tuesday, Dr. Ruth Bergerin with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. We'll be right back. Texas is allowed to continue its ban on most abortions during this pandemic. This after a federal appeals court sided with the state. The ruling allows the ban to stay in place pending further legal arguments. Last month, Governor Greg Abbott ordered hospitals to cancel non-essential surgeries in order to free up space and supplies for coronavirus patients and doctors. State Attorney General Ken Paxton said the order covers all abortions except those needed to protect the health and safety of the mother. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is closing all state parks and historical sites due to the pandemic. The closures went into effect this evening and will continue until the governor says otherwise. It's all a part of the state's efforts to strengthen social distancing practices and prevent gatherings of large groups of people. The San Antonio Zoo says it's losing a half a million dollars in revenue every week after closing because of the coronavirus outbreak. A spokeswoman said when open, the zoo generates about two million dollars a month, which is needed to operate. Because of that, the zoo furloughed a majority of its staff last month. What happened to all the toilet paper and when will things get back to normal? As RJ Marquez discovered, the answer is a little more complicated than you may think. When the pandemic started, one of the first things that flew off store shelves was 
toilet paper. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. It's pretty cheap to buy in bulk, it has no expiration date, and it's a basic necessity. But as many of us have noticed, panic buying has caused a major problem in the supply chain. Americans make up less than 5% of the world's population, but we use more toilet paper than any other country. Data company Statista reported in 2018 that on average we go through 2.7 rolls of toilet paper per week. The Atlantic published an article the same year that said toilet paper sales were estimated at $12 billion in 2017 and Americans accounted for nearly half of the total. Stores have struggled to keep it in stock. Major suppliers have ramped up operations at their paper mills, but even Georgia Pacific, the maker of brands like Quilted Northern and Angel Soft has said it's uncertain when things will go back to normal. Think about this, we probably still use the same amount of toilet paper as we did before the pandemic, but now we're using more of our own supply. We're not eating out, or going to work, or going to school, so we're not using toilet paper from those places. Georgia Pacific estimates that the average American household will use about 40% more toilet paper than usual if people spend all their time at home. The problem is just as bad online. Amazon, Walmart, Target, and HEB stores are overwhelmed with orders. So what's the good news? Is there any? The short answer is yes. Most toilet paper sold in the U.S. is made at paper mills in North America, which means stores are stocked more often. HEB has repeatedly reassured customers that just because shelves are emptier than usual doesn't mean products are gone for good. If you are desperate for toilet paper, you can buy commercial grade at websites that supply restaurants. You can also support our local restaurants that have shifted to selling pantry items and kitchen items like toilet paper and paper towels. We still have toilet paper, but it just might not be as soft as you're used to. For the nine, RJ Marcus.